How are we? Good. So good July the 4th? Yeah. Well, that's five of you. Good. <laughs> good. Uh, I'm English, and I'm pretty sure I had more fun than you did. So uh, go figure. I actually asked my wife. It was like four in the afternoon. We were going to my brother's at like 630, something like that. And I'm like, why is our family getting together for July the 4th? This just doesn't even make sense to me. We're all English. Like, what is happening? So... Uh, but uh, welcome to those of you joining us on our online community. It sounds like, it sounds like, I'm sure I can hear you, sounds like you had more fun than everybody in the room on July 4th. So um, we are glad that you're here. Uh, if you want to go to Israel, it sounds like you're going to go to everywhere. So like just whatever, enjoy that trip, right? Um, but we're glad you're here. If this is your first time and you're going, I don't even know where Israel is, that's okay. That's okay. Welcome. We're glad you're here. You don't need to know where Israel is to be a part of our community, to belong. And so uh, just today, we're leaning into our series called Ripple. If you haven't been here or you've missed some, the big premise is this, that when Jesus is the center of your life, it affects every ripple outward from your life. That, that Jesus is the big deal. He is the Savior. He is the one that has ransomed, rescued. He is the one that has given us purpose and identity. And when he goes to the center of our lives, when we see him as Savior and Lord, and when he sits in the center, what happens is everything that flows outward from your life is different than it was before. And so really the, the whole point of Ripple is walking through Colossians going, Jesus is the big deal. How do we keep him centered? How, how do we live a life where Jesus is at the center? And, and if you were here over the past weeks, you, you know that the big challenge is not to move Jesus from center because he is supreme, meaning he's over everything. And, and inside of that, he is also enough. He's sufficient for everything you will ever need. And I don't know about you, but it helps to know who Jesus is because it frames up who we are. And I don't know what your journey's been like in life, but mine, um, just, just discovering some stuff about myself, right? Because as a kid, like, I was an emotional kid, right? So if you got older brothers, you get this, but my older brothers could push my buttons, right? And in a moment, I could go from being just fine and having the best day to all of a sudden just being triggered and like going to rip one of them apart, right? And just absolutely frustrated because they're bigger than me and I couldn't do anything, right? And so the more I would get triggered and more emotional I would get, the more they would continue to push my buttons until, you know, inevitably I would run to my mom because that's what you should do when you need help, right? <laughs> mom knows all and mom can take down brothers, right? And so I would run to my mom and be like, mom. And she'd be like, what is wrong with you? Why are you so worked up? And then I got married. It didn't get any better. Um, <laughs> because then what I discovered with my wife is we would have like some intense fellowship moments, if you know what I mean. Like we had intense discussions. We didn't fight. Well, maybe, but Right. But in those moments, what would happen in the early moments of our marriage? I'd be like, I'm out. She'd be like, what do you mean you're out? I'm like, I'm leaving. And I would leave, close the door. And we were in an apartment building. I would start to walk down the hall. Right. And as I'm walking down the hall, I'm going, where are you going? <laughs> like, this isn't a good idea. This doesn't make things better. But I feel good. Right. And, and so these emotions were well up. Inevitably, I would come back. She's like, you know, you can't do that. Right. I'm like, what do you mean I can't do that? She's like, you can't just leave. She's like, you got to navigate whatever it is you're feeling, and we got to have a discussion about it. Well, as we got older and longer, what happened is, is I noticed this pattern of, she would just tell me, we're not going to talk about that right now. I'm like, that doesn't help me. That just makes me mad, right? <laughs> but, but I've always had this sense of like being emotional. Like, I, it's not the emotions where I would cry at any moment, but it's, it's the emotions of like, I just don't know everything inside of me is so like, oh, I got to get that, right? And, and so now try and being a pastor and having that. And I started going, man, God, did you put me in the wrong spot? Because this is weird, right? I walk in here and sometimes I'm just melancholy, right? Sometimes I just, eh. And I meet some of you and you're all like, how you doing? And instantly we're in mode of, hey, I'm good. Everything's cool. Or you catch me in one of those moments and I'm like, I'm good. 
And you're like, you don't seem good. And I'm like, I'm good. Right? Because here's the thing. Like, inside of me, there was these, this, this, it is inside of me, and it is a part of me. And, and so then, I was telling you guys last week, I went on a trip with my kids to, to L.A., and on the way back, we got a book, and we began to, uh, if you've heard of the Enneagram, right? Yeah, I thought the Enneagram was a load of rubbish, right? Because here's what happened to me. I tested in the Enneagram and it gave me like, you're these two types. It was inconclusive. You could be this or you could be this. I'm like, well, that's helpful, right? And so if you've heard of the Enneagram, it's essentially that all of humanity falls into nine types, right? And and within those nine types, there are different wings you can take on, which mean different things. But I've always, I've always rejected mine based on you can't figure out who I am, right? And so then we're on the way back and we begin to listen to my kids because I knew what they were. And, and, and we're like, oh, yeah, that's you. Huh? That's you. And what I started to notice was how helpful it was to understand how they're wired to know how to help them through life. And then they're like, well, Dad, which one are you? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, let's listen to these two and figure out. And, and we started to listen to one. They're like, oh, this is you. But there were parts of it. And then I guess this happens with when you begin to figure out your Enneagram. There's parts of it where you go, I don't like that. And the part of mine was, you're emotional. And I started going, I'm not emotional. (laughs) You're emotional, right? Now, I started to analyze my life, and I started to go, oh, my goodness. Like, this is how I'm wired. This is part of who I am. And and part of my struggle being a believer has been that it has to, I have to mute that part of who I am, right? Because when you meet Jesus, you got to be even keel. You got to be like, have it together, especially as a pastor. And I started going, man, as I'm listening to this, I began to feel myself inside being given permission, going, it's okay. This is how you're wired. This is who you are. And beginning to, over the last week, just really lean into and just own these emotions because it's who I am and knowing who you are. There is a freedom inside of it. And when we begin to put this now into spiritual context, when you begin to understand who you are in Christ, there is a freedom that comes with it. And the passage we're about to get into today, I don't know if you read ahead, but you probably read it and went, eh, I don't get it. Let's go on to the next one. Well, I don't get it either, but we're going to talk about it. So uh, if you have a Bible, we are in Colossians chapter 2. And I'm going to finish up because I didn't finish last week, and it's really important we finished last week. Uh, I missed one verse, and so we're going to catch that verse first, then we're going to dive into today's passage. Verse 13 says this, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. That's the verse we missed last week. And here's why this verse is so key, right? He made, he disarmed them, right? And in the disarming, that's actually a bad translation. A better translation of that word is that he disgraced them. He disgraced all of the power behind the world system that is anti to what God wants. So your struggles with sin from your sin nature, these are the powers that are behind your sin nature. All the things you don't like about our broken planet, all the things that are corrupt, all the things that you can't stand because it's the opposite of what God wants, guess what? All of that comes from these powers that give it energy. And what you need to understand today is that God disgraced them. How did he disgrace them? The word disgraced has to do with derobing them. Essentially, they were a king with a robe on. And Jesus came along at the cross and took the robe off and disgraced them publicly in front of everybody. If you wanted to disgrace somebody back in those days, you stripped them naked. And you heap shame on them just by them being naked. Right? And in this context, what that word disarmed is, which is better translated disgrace, is that those powers that have had a hold over our world, that have had a hold over our culture, that have had a hold over your sin nature, that, that, it, that was a part of you, he's saying here that Jesus in the cross disgraced them once and for all. 
And then it gets better because it says that he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. He made a public spectacle. This is language taken from if you were a Roman Empire and you conquered something, what you did is you took prisoners of war and you took, you took all the loot you could from war. And what you would do, and there's a story, I read it this week, there's a story of one of the Roman emperors, and they set up, they actually set up scaffolding all through the city. And every person, every inhabitant of that city came out, and they would set themselves up, right? They would find their perch, find their seat, and they'd be like, man, I got my hummus, I got my pita bread, right? I got my large Slurpee. I'm going to watch the show. And what the show was was this, that the military would march all of the stuff that they'd taken in war. Why? Because they were declaring victory. And so what happened was, is, is this one story I was reading, it took three days. There was so much stuff. It took three days of marching in front of the entire town. And when you got to the end, guess who was at the end? The king's family that you conquered. And then guess who was right behind them? And guess what the king's family was doing, by the way? They were, they were noticeably begging for their lives, right? Because they'd been conquered. Then you got the king who had been stripped of his royal garments because he was no longer a king because he'd been conquered. And he came along towards the last day, towards the back. Now, what has Jesus done? Jesus has taken all the powers that are against what God wants, all the powers that are working against you, he has taken them all and he has paraded them past who? Past all of us. Why? To show you that they are defeated, that he has conquered them, that they have no place in your life. The enemy has no hold in your life. Why? Because Jesus, not anything we did, because Jesus has triumphed over the enemy. Your sin nature, that thing that you think you can't defeat because all you want to do is keep sinning, which we talked about last week that you pick up and put on you, guess what? The power behind that is gone. You give it power. That is the victory. That is who we are. It gets one level better because it says he triumph, triumphing over them by the cross. You know what the cross was? The cross was a tool that was used by the Roman Empire to heap shame in victory. Okay, Jesus is stripped naked. He is shamed. And they, they're thinking, they're thinking, we've humiliated Jesus. We've humiliated the King of Kings. We have finally got victory. You know what happened? Jesus conquered them by the humiliation to heap humiliation on them. Y'all, church, you are victors today. That's who you are. The enemy has no place over you today. And it's in that context that he carries on to our passage today. Verse 16, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? I just saved you tuition at some college because that's what they'll teach you when you go. Well, what's the therefore, therefore, right? I'm like, I'm paying for this. Therefore, do not let anyone, right? What is the therefore built on? Your victors. The enemy has been crushed. The enemy has been embarrassed, disgraced, shamed. The enemy has no power. The enemy has been defeated. And he says, now, because the enemy is defeated, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So he goes, hey. Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or by the days that you observe. And we go, okay, that's weird. Like, I don't think the church is judging me when I eat in and out I mean, they definitely are when I eat McDonald's over in and out You should judge me, right? But for us, it's, it's, it's like this weird thing. Like, like is it Chick-fil-A or is it Cane's? Depends on the day, Right? Except we're in church and everybody, every Christian goes to Chick-fil-A, right? Because that's what Christians do. Okay. But here's the, here's the weird part. It wouldn't make sense for us to begin talking about, well, one place has clean food and one place has unclean food. You see, the threat on the church of Colossae that this is written to by Paul, handwritten to a church that existed in real time, real space, 
the threat on them was that Jesus is not enough. And so there was a group of Jews who had mixed in some mysticism And this group of Jews with with mysticism mixed in began to tell the church, began to tell the believers, the followers of Jesus, they began to tell them, hey, hey, if you if if you want an extra level of your your Christianity, you know what? You should watch what food you eat. You should stay away from white bread and only eat wheat. Right? Right? Because what they were doing is leaning into the Old Testament scriptures and pulling principles out of the Old Testament and applying them to today. And they weren't designed for that. So what you had, you had this weird kind of happening where food became a really big, what you ate and don't, what you eat and don't eat became a really big deal. And on top of that, they had days, they had feasts, they had celebrations that they considered religious. And inside of those religious celebrations, what that did is is when they felt like they observed them, they were worshiping the way God wanted them to and everybody else, they're just sinners. So if you want the next level from a moral perspective, if you want superiority in your faith, then you need to keep these days. You need to have your Sabbath. You need to have, notice, notice what he says. Verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. He said, what he's saying in this moment is, hey, all of that Old Testament, all those laws that you're holding to before Jesus showed up, they're just a shadow. You held a Sabbath because you needed to remind yourself that you're not God. You needed to remind yourself that you need to rest. But what it's saying is the reality is found in Christ. Real rest is found in the person of Jesus. What 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 he's saying is like this. If I put a chair right here and that chair casts a shadow over here, right? And I told you, hey, hey, come on up. I want you to sit on the shadow. Take a seat in the chair, but you got to sit in the shadow. You'd be like, it ain't going to hold me. I'd be like, try it anyways. I want to laugh. right? The reality is you're going, no, 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 no. The shadow, the shadow is merely pointing me to the chair. And what he's saying in this moment is when it comes to things like observing food, like having these holy days, those things were never designed to enhance your relationship with God. They were always designed to point you to Jesus, which got me thinking. What are the things in our world that we use to enhance our relationship, to enhance our identity that we're never meant to enhance our identity. Let's let's just pick one. Serving. Right? You you started serving because, man, Jesus Jesus rescued me, and how could I not be involved with serving other people? Right? Jesus gave this to me, and like, I I got to give it away. But somewhere in the process of serving, you were like, yeah, they just made me a head usher. And people are like, head usher, what's that? <laughs> but for you, it became an identity. Or you just got made the lead of the parking lot, right? And now all of a sudden, you, you begin to feel like you're something in, in, in God's eyes because you have a standing, you have a position of serving. And here's the thing, serving was never designed to give you an identity. You already have an identity in Christ. Amen. You see, what's crazy is like you get, you get talking to people and they're like, well, I've been, I've been teaching that Sunday school class for like 15 years. And you begin to talk to them and they start to go like, like it's their class. I love that you serve in kids. We need more people to serve in kids. But when serving in kids begins to identify who you are before God, something's missing. And that's what he's saying here. As serving was never meant to be about your identity and your relationship with God. So what are those spiritual disciplines in your life? For example, like prayer. Man, I, I, yeah, buddy, pray without ceasing. I'm up at like four in the morning and I've been praying forever. We're told to pray without ceasing, right? But when prayer and getting up in the morning gives me some kind of extra identity or extra step up in my relationship with God, you're no longer on the grounds of prayer as God called you to pray. You're now on the grounds of I'm earning something about what I do. You weren't called to that. You're you're quiet time with God, right? You get up, man, I'm going to spend time with God. You know why you need to spend time with God? Because God wants to spend time with you because he loves you. 
That's it. You don't have to get up because, man, okay, I have my quiet time today. Check. Anybody sees me today, I'm spiritual today. I have my quiet time. You were spiritual before you ever cracked the book. You're a spirit being. Your walk with God isn't dependent on that. However, your closeness with God can come through spending time with God. There's a big difference between closeness with God and identity. I got to move on. I'm way out of time. Gosh. Verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Well, there's a verse. Do not let anyone, right? And these words are used. False humility. Uh, and in this context, what they believe was happening was the believers were fasting themselves, were starving themselves. They were, they were beating their body in an attempt to get more out of their worship experiences. And, and, and so there was this humility of like, oh, I've been fasting for about a month. And people around them like, you need to eat. <laughs> right? But what was happening was, is they were doing it as a form of, oh, look how humble I am. I don't even eat. It was a false humility. And the goal behind it was that I am going to, I am going to self-deprecate. I am going to self-harm, essentially. I am going to deprive my physical so that I get to a point where now when I enter this moment of worship, which here it is worship of angels, which that's weird. But in the moment of worshiping, what they would do is, and it kind of, Commentaries are all over the place on what is worship of angels, but what's, what's pretty consistently like claimed is that they were invoking angels into their worship so that they could get visions beyond that moment. Essentially, what was happening is they were using the starvation of themselves and the calling on these spiritual realms to try and open up passageways that they could see things that others couldn't. They were enhancing their worship experience so that they could advance their status so that they could claim that they were a little closer that they had insights that no one else did you know we get on real shaky ground when we begin to make worship an emotional experience what do I mean by that well let me finish and then we'll, we'll come back to that do not let anyone who delights in false humility and worship of angels disqualify you. Such people also go into great detail about what they have seen. So, right, they're telling people, I've seen this and I've seen and I've experienced this and that there, right? And their unspiritual minds puff them up with idle notions. They have lost connection from the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by the ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. What he's saying is, hey, hey, they got worship, but Jesus isn't the center. They're not even connected to Jesus anymore because it's about them and what they can muster up and what they can experience and what they can pull out of this moment. And he says, man, for them, they're disconnected from the whole. I don't know, like just trying to make this practical. You ever, you ever come into a worship space? And man, you're there and you leave and you're like, oh, I felt the presence of God today. Nothing wrong with that. But what happens the next time you come back and you don't feel the presence of God? Well, see, then what we start to do is we start to question, right? Man, Jala, he, he didn't play those sweet enough riffs for me today to catch it, you know? Or Lily, she got those sweet keys. And I'm gonna try and mess her up. She told me I couldn't mess her up, but I'm gonna try to mess you up. But she, she didn't play those sweet keys like I like those sweet keys and then I couldn't feel them. Or I came in and I wasn't ready. Or they didn't sing the songs that I like. And see what happens is we can quickly make this, this about us. We can quickly make this about what we feel in an experience. And the problem is when you start to go, I don't feel the same anymore, we begin to look for reasons why and we begin to discount the whole thing. It's great, and this comes from a dude with emotion. 
is phenomenal when your emotions line up with a moment. But that normally happens when Jesus is the center of that moment, not my emotions and what I want out of that moment. And church, we get on really shaky ground when we begin to make this about us and about the experience I need to have. Instead of coming in here and going, man, can you believe that Jesus saved us? Can you believe that the forces of evil, they have no hold on me because of what Jesus did? That's enough reason for me to stand up and go, you know what, I'm all saved. You see how it works? If we're not careful, we begin to make this moment about us and in making this moment about us, we lose why we're even here in the first place. And that's what they were doing here. They've made it about what they can experience next. If you're here, by the way, and you're struggling to feel God, don't give up. If you're here today and you're going, man, I don't even feel like God is close. Man, feelings are real and they're, they're connected to our souls. But it's in the moment when your feelings aren't there that you need to go back to the top and you need to remind yourself of who I am. You need to remind yourself that I'm forgiven today, that God loves me. You need to hear this. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. God loves you very, very much. He is mad about you. God is ridiculously in love with you. He always has been and he always will be. And just because you can't feel him in this moment, you got to go back to truth and stay on truth. Keep Jesus the center, which reminds you that you are loved by all of heaven today. And he is in your corner and on your side. Because otherwise we drift and then all of a sudden we begin to make this about us and I can't feel and then I'm out. When Jesus is the center, he causes it to grow. Verse 20. So here it is again. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, so all the things that are behind the culture and behind how this world works, you, you died to those. They have no ownership over you. Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on human commands and teaching. He's saying, hey, all those things that you're talking about, they're temporary. They're temporary. They're temporary. Verse 23, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value. They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. He, he, he's now calling out saying, hey, there's these people and they're telling you that Jesus isn't enough, but here's the truth, that they're doing all these things. They're walking by false humility. They're starving themselves. They're working against their own bodies. They're trying to have these spiritual experiences. They're doing everything they can to grasp every moment, but you need to know something. They still haven't figured out how to control their own bodies in their sensual indulgences because their minds are based here on this moment and not on the eternal. And today, just kind of wrapping this thing up, I feel like this is the church. I feel like so, so much of what is preached and so much, much of what is written in books is about how can I control my sin? How can I have sin management? And so then we begin to tell people, well, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do that, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And all of a sudden it's about how well I do at the do's and don'ts. And what happens is in the midst of that, I, I stop sinning for a little bit and I think I'm spiritual. But being good doesn't equal being godly. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that it's only as Jesus changes us from the inside out that the ripples in our life, sin stops showing up. So if you're here today and you're trying to manage your sin, that you're fighting, trying to control sin, you will never control sin. You are no match for sin. You won't control your desires. The only way you will control the ripple of desire in your life is by putting Jesus back at the center and reminding yourself who you really are. I'm gonna steal a verse, I think Ron's up next week, but I'm gonna steal a verse from Ron, don't tell him. 
because it would be incomplete without it. Because he just got done saying, don't focus on the temporary, focus on the eternal. Chapter three, verse one, since then, since then, you have been raised with Christ. You, you have been what? Raised with Christ, because we're in him. Set your soul, set your heart, set your soul on things above. Set your soul on things above. What's above? Jesus is above. Set your soul on things above, things that are eternal, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Do you know where you are today? I don't care how you feel. I don't care where you're at in the sense of like what your emotions are telling you. This is true of you today. No matter how bad it is here, you are seated in the heavenlies with Jesus right now. Why? Because he is in you and you are in him. That means all of this temporary stuff, it'll go away. All of your worries here, it'll go away. And church, we got to remind ourselves if we're going to keep Jesus at the center, we got to remind ourselves who we are are. So God, we come before you today. Jesus, thank you for rescue today. Thank you for saving us today. God, I pray over this room that anyone who has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be their day. God, I pray for those in the room that have been busy just trying to do it on their own. God, that they're just striving, they're trying to create experiences and trying to feel close to you all in their own strength, that today would be the day when they let go and they just rest in the fact that you've already done it all for them. That God, the experiences stem from letting you work in them and through them. So in a moment of just silence, We don't do this very often here, but I want to pray for you today. But if you're in the room and you know you need to accept Jesus as your Savior today, you know that sin has been working against you and you need to have be rescued today. But if that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. That if you're here and you go, I need Jesus to rescue me today. On the count of three, just shoot your hand up. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. God sees you today. I want to pray over you today. God, I pray for this room. I pray for the hands raised in this room. And I pray for the souls that those hands represent. God, I pray for those that are crying out to you to rescue them today. I pray that you would show up and you would rescue like only you can. God, I pray in this moment that you would let them know that by the physical, just the raising of a hand to say, I believe and I'm in and I need rescue, that God, you show up and you invade them. God, I pray that they would feel and sense you surrounding them. God, I pray that they would know that they have been rescued by you today because that's what Jesus does. So God, thank you for rescue. For the rest of the room, God, I pray that you are over every situation. And I pray that you would, as only you can, God, in these next moments, would you move the things that need to move, well, it, whether it be self-disciplines that we're trusting in or it be experiences, or God, it would just be that we're trying to manage sin. Would you set us free in these moments as we sing about you being our cornerstone, that it is in Jesus that the ripple affects every area of our life. We love you and everybody said.